So let's start the seminar. And today's speaker is Travis Gagi from Dalhousie University. He's going to talk about power genomic FM indexes. So please start if you are ready. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about pangenomic FM indexes. So FM indexes are a data structure that's been around since, uh, well, since 2000. They're very popular in bioinformatics. I'm going to explain how they work, sort of, a little bit, not really in depth, and why we want to scale them up to, at the moment they're used for single genomes, I'm going to explain why we want to scale them up to things called pun genomes, which I'll also explain. Um, okay, oh good, huh. okay. So the reason everyone loves FM index is because they're used for DNA alignment. So, um, to understand what we want to change about them, we I'm going to review what how DNA alignment works. So uh, these days, uh, whole genome sequencing is increasingly uh, used in in medicine and biological research. So what happens? You you send your you want your genome sequenced. So you send away a saliva or a blood sample or something like that, and uh, the people who get it. Uh, put it in a machine called a, a sequencer. So most of the, the market share is still held by Illumina. So most sequencing is what's called short read sequencing. So what happens, they dump your saliva or blood sample in, and then it doesn't produce your whole genome, which is about 3 billion characters. It produces these little chunks of the genome called DNA reads, which are about uh, 100, 100 to 200 characters. So you can, and, and then uh, it produces all these reads, millions and millions of them, enough to cover the whole genome several times over on average, um, although the, the coverage does vary. And then, uh, and then it feeds these reads into software called DNA aligners. So the, the two most popular ones are called Bowtie and BWA. Both of these are actually the, the core of them is, are, they're both built on FM indexes. So what happens? So suppose your genome is gata cat. It could produce the reads uh, gata attack and a cat. And then the DNA aligners are supposed to figure out how to put these together to get your genome, right? Now, this would be very difficult if we didn't know what a human genome looked like. So this was the case back in the 90s when we hadn't sequenced any human genomes. And that was why it took years and the Human Genome Project took years and years and billions of dollars. But now we know what a human genome looks like. Everybody's genome looks more or less the same, 99.9 .9 or something like that uh, uh, percent. And so we have the reference genome from the Human Genome Project. So what can happen is the DNA aligners look and say, okay, well, where do the where do the reads fit against the reference genome? So what they look for, uh, yeah, people can see my cursor. They try to find long matches, so long sections of the reads that exactly match the reference sequence. These are called seeds. So for example, here it finds a seed of length three. Here it finds a seed of length three. And here the whole thing is a seed, but the whole thing is a match. So I can say, okay, so this, I match it here, this, I match it here. And then after it's found these seeds, it uses dynamic programming to sort of extend from exact matches for the seeds to approximate matches, approximate matches for the whole reads. And then it sort of chains the reads together. and gets what's called the consensus sequence, which is its idea of what your gen genome looks like. So far, so good. The problem is, um, even though people are 99.9% .9 the same, 3 billion is so big that there can still be sections of the genome that are significantly different. And the reads from those sections might be so different that the aligners can't find long reads. Sorry, can't find long seeds, sufficiently long seeds to do the, to do the matching. So for example, here, if uh, the genome, if your genome is gata gat, then it can find the seed in the first read but here, there's no seed of length three. So it doesn't know what to do with this read. And here, well, actually, there is a, a, a match of length three, a seed, but it will put it over here. So what it's going to do is it, it doesn't know what to do the, with these reads. They're generally ignored. They're considered maybe it's, it's contaminants. You know, somebody sneezed, a fly landed on the test tube. It's non-human DNA. So they get ignored. 
And then the, the, the sections which are missing are frequently filled in from the reference genome. So that means that here you'd get a C because it doesn't know what else to put there. The problem is that's bad if ATAG is pathogenic. So if those two variations cause a disease, when present together, they cause a disease, then you're not, that's not going to show up in the genome that you get back because it's going to say, oh, well, this, I think it's a C because I don't have any other evidence otherwise. So um, is this just a, a problem that we made up so that we can study fun data structures and computer science stuff? No, it really happens. So this is a, uh, a quote from a website called Stat News from a few years ago. So this is not exactly, it's popular science, but it's not exactly mainstream. I think most people have never read this. Um, so it says to the to the scientist puzzlement, however, so there were these kids, the scientists, the, the, the diagnosticians thought they had a disease called Baratella Scott, which is they knew what the genetic variation that underlies that is. However, when they sequenced them, the sequence, the, the, the sequences they got back said, nope, they don't have that variation. So they, they, they figured out this is because, well, okay, uh, it was like trying to check spelling in a Webster's dictionary from which a, pr a prankster had told a torn handful of pages. Many pieces of the boys' genomes called short reads weren't in the reference genome. So you couldn't check them uh, for the variations that were causing the disease. Okay, yeah. So this is cause, oh, right. So the title of this is reference bias because you get back the consensus sequences that you get back, everyone's pretty much the same, but you actually get the, the alignment process it causes us to get consensus sequence. So they're actually a little bit too much the same, a little bit too much like the reference sequence. So this reference bias limits the kind of genetic variation can be detected, and it leaves some patients without diagnosis and potentially without proper treatment. So this is actually a quote from The Guardian, which is a mainstream newspaper. And this is at the beginning, at the end of January. So the thing is, that would be bad enough if it affected everybody equally, but it doesn't. So the human reference sequence was, was put together in upstate New York in the late 90s. And so it was, it was, it's a mismatch, actually, mishmash of genomes from people who were picked from the population or from in Buffalo. Most of it's actually one person. Um, and so as it says here, if, you, if you're less like that person from Buffalo, then precision medicine is not gonna work as well for you. Um, so our understanding of diversity within populations of European descent is now so good that you can start to use it for precision medicine, but for other populations, we don't have this kind of data. So this is going to increase healthcare disparities above and beyond what they are today. A huge new project is offering a different solution with the aim to represent global diversity, a human, so this is where pangenomics come in. You don't want one reference genome. You want to somehow represent lots of people. So this is the website for the Human Pangenome Reference Consortium. Uh, in Canada now, they love this equity, diversity, and inclusion stuff. So this says diverse human references drive genomic discoveries for everyone. So yeah, so let's talk about this equity, diversity, and inclusion, EDI. So um, this is actually somewhat serious stuff. So for example, uh, there's, the, there's a chemotherapy, class of chemotherapy drugs called fluoropyrimidines. And um, it's given to hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people every year, but a significant percentage of people actually react really badly. And it's, you know, experienced reactions can, which can vary from severe to fatal. Like, remember, these are chemo drops. They're supposed to make you sick anyway. Um, so the problem is, so we've started to figure out why some people react badly. The problem is those studies are, were done entirely on white people. Okay, so ethnic minority patients will usually be given conventional doses of the drugs because they might not have the variations that make them react badly, that make Europeans react badly to them, but they might have other variations that make other ethnic groups react badly to them. Some of these patients will, will carry other ethnic specific variants, which also affect their ability to met metabolize these drugs, but we don't currently genotype for those. We don't look for them because we don't know what they are. So actually, um, uh, while I was waiting before the talk, there's actually on the Riken uh, website, there was a study, um, 
that was done here that describes the th same thing about uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so I didn't, I resisted the temptation to, to like put a quote in the slides at the last minute. But yes, it said, it says, now we did it. Most of the studies were done for Europeans and East Asians, and now they've done it for lots of other groups. So, um, I mean, okay, so it's on the Recon website now. It was done in February, I think. So anyway, this is, it's getting better, but not very quickly. So in 2016, almost all of the, the, the genomic data was European. By two, uh, sorry, 2009. By 2016, it dropped to 81 percent. Um, now it says 2019, it's, it's down to about 78.4 percent. Um, African is, is, is growing quickly because people know that Africa is the cradle of humanity actually has more genetic diversity than any, anywhere else in the world. So that's what people are focusing on. Um, so getting back to pangenome graphs and this reference bias, the problem is it's not just enough to have lots of data because you can't represent all the variations in one reference sequence, okay? So I was, this is back to the Guardian, this mainstream newspaper at the end of January. I was really surprised when I ran across this because it's a mainstream newspaper and it's actually talking about data structures. We need to come up with a better data structure to encode that information. In particular, it's even talking about genomic data structures, pan-genome graphs. In contrast to the current reference, which is just a long string of letters, the genome graph shows variations between genomes as detours on an otherwise shared path. Path. This will enable researchers and doctors to map short reads to the version of the path that best fits their sample. So the thing is, okay, but so they're building this out of 350 people, but it says, okay, 350 is better than one, but you still have to make choices, right? Because, well, in the next slide, we'll see why. Um, who get, who do you sample? Who do you not sample? As long as the reference contains only a subset, arguably somebody will not make the cut. This is not a conversation you want to have in the 21st century. It's like, oh, well, we're going to leave your variations out because hmm, it, we just don't want your variations in the representation of human diversity. It, that's not something you want to get into. Um, so the problem is, the, currently, if you try to put all the variations into the graph, it gets noisy, right? So, so consider these five little toy genomes. You can think of a pan-genome graph as a deterministic finite automaton, right? So it's it's just a, except it doesn't have an initial state and a, and a final state. So it's a directed edge labeled graph. So for example, this, this is a toy pan-genome graph for these little toy, pan, uh, toy genomes. Notice that it has, you look at the graph and it looks like ATAG should be in there. It looks like somebody had ATAG, but that could be that pathogenic combination of variations. It's not in those genomes and it might not be there because it kills you. So you don't actually want to have it there because it's, it's not reflecting your data set. This is called a chimeric match from this monster the chimera, which had a head of a lion and a body of a something and a tail of a something else. Okay. The problem is the more people you put in, the, the more variations you try to pack in there, the fuzzier the graph becomes and the more chimeric matches you get. So what we'd actually like to do is not index the graph. We'd like to index the data set, right? Because you can't get a chimeric match on the data set. The problem there is you could get a lot of matches in the data set, even if they all correspond to only a few matches in the graph. So what we'd really, really like to do is be able to somehow take a read and find a good seed and find a match for the seed, a single match in the data set, and then find all the non-chimeric matches in the graph. So all of the, this, this GAT corresponds to this GAT, but somehow magically we also get this GAT over here as well. So this sounds like wishful thinking, but it actually turns out that with some data structure magic, it's not actually that hard. And maybe you'll believe me by the end of the talk. Okay, so the theorem we get is 
This is just a sort of a sketch. Given a pangenomic data set of total length n and a pangenome graph for it, we can store the data set in reasonable space. Now, remember, these are potentially thousands of genomes, each of which are three gigabytes each. So it's terabytes of data. So you have to store it in much less space than n, such that when given a read of length m, we can find good seeds in the reads with respect to the data set in m log n time. So that means no chimeric matches. And we, and we find all of these matches. For each seed, we list all the distinct vertices in the graph where we start processing occurrences in the data set of that seed in constant time for vertex listed. So that means that we find one match. We, we somehow find all the places for each, for GAT, we find one occurrence or something. And then we list all the places where non-chimeric matches get, start being processed in the, in the graph as a DFA. So we're going to do this with FM indexes because they're they're amazing. Um, I spent I don't know like the past twenty something years of my life studying these things. Uh, no, not quite twenty, but okay, um, almost twenty. So how did these work? I don't have time to go into the details. A lot of the people listening probably know about these things anyway. So it's it, they're based on the Burroughs Wheeler transform. You take you take the string you want to index. You take the cyclic shifts. You sort them, and then you take the last column. This is called the Burroughs Wheeler transform. And by the magic of the Burroughs Wheeler transform, what you can do is something called counting. So, given a pattern, you can quickly find the lexicographic interval. Now, because these these things are sorted, all of these that start with the pattern will be together. So, you find the lexicographic interval somehow. Um, of these, these, these rotations that start with the pattern. The size of that interval will be the number of occurrences of the pattern in the, in the index text. So this is called counting. So look, there are two ATs in Gata Cap. How does this work? Mm, well, you start with the whole interval. This is the interval of um, characters at the front of the array that, that follow empty string in the BWT. So everything follows empty string. Then you say, okay, well, which of these follow T? You can take the T's and then you say, okay, well, these T's, there are three T's and those three T's are down there or down here in the, uh, in the first column. And then you say, okay, which of those are uh, preceded by A's? Well, there are two A's in front of those T's and those two A's are there. Now, why are why is it these two A's and not this one? Well, these are the, the second and third A's. So they're the second and third A's here. Why? Because it's lexicographically sorted. We don't have time to go into that. If you add a sublinear data structure, sublinear size data structure, so sublinear in the in size of the text, you can also do locating. Somehow you can find out where those matches are. So this is called the suffix array. You sample it because it's a permutation, so you don't have the space to store it. And then you find out that those, those ATs start at one and six, at positions one and six. Okay, if you, add an, if you add more sublinear space data structures, you can do something called mem finding. And this, mems are sort of people's now, some people's favorite kind of seed. So a substring is called a maximal exact match or a mem between the pattern and the text. If the mem occurs, the mem is a substring of the pattern that occurs in the text and you can't extend it in either direction and still have it occur in the text. So for example, the mems of gata gat with respect to gata cat are gat, ta, and gat. The mems of gata gat with, if you take all of those gene, little toy genomes and concatenate them, you start to see the benefit of pan genomes pangenomic references, because now the mems are longer and more informative. So remember, the mems are gata and tagat. Okay. So seeding, okay, you can, you, you add, you, you build, you take the BWT and you, you, you build an FM index that can do counting, and then you add these sublinear space data structures, and you can do locating, and you can do mem finding. So basically, how some DNA aligners work now is you index the reference genome, you find the ranges for the lexicographic ranges for the reads MEMS with respect. You find the MEMS, you find the lexicographic ranges for those MEMS. 
And then you list the starting positions, the MEMS in the reference genome. So this is the seeding. And then people do this dynamic programming to extend the seeds and like tie them together and build the consensus sequence. Okay. But this is the part we're interested in, the indexing part, the seeding part. Why not just scale this up for pangenomic alignment? Okay, so it works beautifully. It's really popular. It works beautifully with one genome. Why not just make it work for thousands? We really, really tried. So I said, I've been working on this stuff for almost 20 years. Other people have been working on it. Well, FM index has only been around for like 23 years, but other people have been trying to do this for much longer than I have, a bit longer than I have. And we didn't really, it's not as easy as it sounds. Okay, so this is sort of a history of the past 20 something years. So the, the FM index, like I said, the conference version came out in 2000. So with the, for the FM index, you can do fast counting, fast locating, you can do fast mem finding, but it was not scalable. Why not? Because of those sublinear space data structures. So they're generally something like N over log N. Log N is like 30, right? So they're gonna be about a 30th of the size of the data set. But if you have a thousand genomes, like I said, human genomes are almost all the same. You can compress them by a factor of about a thousand. So a thousand is a lot bigger than 30. So suddenly those sublinear things are the biggest part of the index. They're not sublinear enough. Okay, so this was realized fairly early on. This is a slide from Gonzalo Navarro's keynote talk at WCTA 2008 in, in uh, Australia somewhere maybe Melbourne. Um, and uh, so he has, he was saying, yes, he could, in 2008, this is actually when uh, the Illumina in, uh, came out with sequencing by synth synthesis and the next generation sequencing. So this is when stuff started to really get fast. If people have seen, there's a graph that's really common that shows the, the cost or the time of sequencing a human genome and it's dropping slowly sort of according to Moore's law. And then suddenly around 2008, it drops like a rock. Um, so in about 2008, Gonzalo could see what was coming. So sequencing genomes is becoming fast and cheap. It was. Just about then, it was becoming really fast and cheap. So he said, we will have databases of thousands or millions of genomes. We do now. Um, the, 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 they will have lots of applications, but just the sublinear part we mentioned is big, OK? So he was actually sort of suggesting going out, going and trying to find other things that weren't based on the BWT because they had they had found a technique which we'll cover on the next slide. Uh, they could do counting, but the locating was really hard. So he was suggesting using a different kind of indexing. I actually I just included this slide because I love this picture. So everyone knows what happens with this picture. The the Roadrunner zips up quietly and says beep beep and Wiley Coyote jumps off the cliff. So actually after DCC at uh, 17, so six years ago, yeah. And this is just coincidence. We didn't set this up. It's just life imitating art. Um, there was me, there was Nicola Pratza, and I'm glad I didn't say beep beep and he didn't jump off the cliff because about half an hour after this picture was taken, he told me about something called the toehold limit. Actually, that's what I called it. Um, and so what that does is it lets you find one. So this is what, uh, this RLCSA is the thing you could do counting and it was scalable, but you couldn't do locating, you couldn't do mem finding. So they tried to use that, but then Gonzalo said, okay, we're, that's when he started looking at other techniques. So the total lemma, you could do counting, you could locate one occurrence of a pattern. You didn't have mem finding yet, but it was scalable. So let's see how that worked. So this is the BWT of sort of, sort of the BWT of the concatenation of those genomes. This is the concatenation of the genomes. The little boxes are pointers. So technically, if you're interested in this stuff, this, these are suffix array entries. So this brown box is, where is this brown box? Here. That doesn't look like the same color. The red box is here. The green box is here. So this we have stored where the uh, where these are. 
and we have them stored at run boundaries in the VWT. Now it works out because uh, because of the magic of the VWT, it tends its run length compressible. If you have thousands of genomes, your BWT will tend to have long runs of the same character, like T T T T T A T T T T T dollar C C C G G G G G D. Okay, why mm, magic? Okay, so the Toho lemma. Um, let's look for Tagant. Okay, so. Like we said, you start with the interval is everything. Well, you get to pick, because it's everything, you can pick a T and you can pick it at a run boundary. So you have stored where it is, well, actually where its successor is, this is this T, because this is this little brown dollar sign, okay? And then you can say, okay, uh, we do some Burroughs Wheeler magic and we can figure out the interval for uh, stuff that precedes T, okay, which is some A's and also some T's. So this happens, the thing that preceded RT is an A, so we're happy. Now we do another, this is called a backward step. It's not usually called FM or PWT magic, but it is. So here we do a step backwards and we've got a C. So we know where it is, but it's not the character we want. So if our interval does not contain a G, then we're done because there's no occurrence of Tagat. But if it does contain a G, because the character we're looking at is not a G, then it must contain a, a run boundary of Gs. So either the preceding G, which there isn't one in this case, either the preceding G is the end of a run of Gs, or the next G is the start of a run of Gs, in which case we have its position stored, right? Because we have this, we know where this blue thing is. So we go from this C, we say, okay, we don't like you. We know where you are, but you're not what we want. We're gonna go to this G. And so notice we jump from here to over here and this turns red. And we say, okay, so we have GAT. It's in the interval. So it still matches the rest of this stuff. We're all happy. We know where you are. So now we do more Boris Wheeler magic and we have A, G, A, T, we're happy. And then we have T-A-G-A-T, -A -A and then you do one more step and you have this T precedes T-A-G-A-T, -A -A you have the interval and you have the location of one occurrence. So that's the toehold level. It doesn't seem complicated enough to have required 14 years, actually 13 years, um, from when Gonzalo started saying we should be doing this to when we to when uh, Nicola Prazza and his, his supervisor Alberto Policriti figured it out, but it is very neat. So. In retrospect, it seems it's kind of obvious. But. So then what we did, we had we built this thing called the R index, which we're not going to go into because it's not actually useful for what we want to do in this talk. Um, it was it, it got us a J sample publication, so it was useful for something. It can do fast locating, fast counting, fast locating, but it can't do mem finding. So we 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 took the toehold lemma, we figured out how to get all of the occurrences quickly. We reached out to to Christina Boucher and Ben Lang made it. And Ben wrote uh, the Bowtie DNA aligner and said, oh, let's let's scale everything up. And so he wrote it, but it didn't have a, uh, it didn't have mem finding, so nobody used it. So we said, okay, we really need the mem finding. And we were willing to give up counting in order to get the mem finding. So we don't get the interval. So we we wrote this software called Money, which is finished for multi. So how does money work? It's basically just the toehold lemma plus a data structure called the longest common extension data structure, LCE. What does an LCE data structure do? If you know two positions in the, the, the data set, if you know two positions, then it can quickly tell you how far they match. For example, this tagat, if you say here, here, and tagat, it's going to come back and say two because TAC and TAG match on TA. So in particular, anywhere where you know if you're in the BWT, you can do a comparison, an LCE query with one of these colored boxes, or remember that moving, that block, black box that was moving around, we know where that is. So we can do LCE queries from there as well. So let's look for GATA GAT which doesn't occur. Remember, gat to gat when we did a mem finding, that was the example. 
And the examples were gata, uh, the, the mems were gata and taget. Well, the toehold lemma gives you taget. It says this is taget. But notice neither of these characters are A's. So there is no occurrence of A-T-A-G-A-T -A -A in, our, in our collection of genomes. But we know that since these things are lexicographically sorted, the longest, the longest match starting here, so the thing that's preceded by an A that matches T-A-G-A-T -A -A for the longest is either the preceding A or it's the next A. So, and we know where this is, and the preceding A must be a run boundary, and the next A must be a run boundary. So we can ask here and say, okay, what's the longest common extension of these two? And it's going to say one, because TA, and this is just TT, so it matches on T. And we go here and we say, what's the longest common extension between this and this? And it says TA, and well, this is TAG, and this is TAC. So it says two. So we know that when we jump up here, and we know where this one is because it's at a run boundary. So we jump to a run boundary. Then we know that it matches on the A and the TA. So here, these numbers are recording the lengths of the matches. So we have, it goes up until five and then it drops to three. And then we do some more Boris Wheeler magic and we say, okay, well, where, where does the, where's the character that precedes this A? It's here, it's a G, it's what we want. Okay, so this is, this was a match of length three. This one is a match of one longer, it's a match of length four. And then we do one more and we say, so this is, this is uh, something that starts with GAT, but we do not have the interval, right? Because when we jumped, ah, when we jumped here to this A, we don't have a way to find out where all the things that start with TA are. So we lose the interval, we lose the count. So with money, we can fi quickly find the mems of P with respect to T, these nice good seeds. How can we find, so, we, but then we were stuck. We wondered how can we find the lexicographic ranges for the mems, the counts, everything, the, the, the FM index, the first thing you try to do is find a lexicographic range. How do you find the occurrence? And then once you find the range, then somehow you want to find the, the, the occurrences, the MEMS in the data set. This is the locating. This is the next thing you always do. And then you want to map the occurrences in the data set to the occurrences in the graph. Well, we can actually do this, but it's slow. It takes time proportional to the number of matches in the data set. So we want to do it without spending time proportional to the number of occurrences in the data set. We want to do it in something like time proportional to the number of matches in the graph. But how do we do even this problem? So I was at Wabi and I was depressed because we weren't figuring this out. And some students took me out for kebabs and we figured it out. And the answer to this question is, how do we do all this stuff? We shouldn't, don't, don't do this. This is hard. We don't know how to do this quickly, but we don't have to. So we came up with a new approach. Well, actually, it's not a very new approach. It's actually basically just the same thing we've always been doing. Um, this is unpublished uh, joint work with Andre Balash, Edren Goga, and Alesha Patesha from Comenius University in Bratislava. They were the students who took me out for the kebabs and helped me figure this stuff out. So what do we do? Well, suppose you decide to tag the characters in the data set with stuff. What stuff? For example, fruits and vegetables. I don't care what stuff you tag it with. You tag it like this. And then you, you ask, okay, you give me the, the place, for example, TA, you give me a line where there's a TA here. And you say, okay, I, I, I have a TA, there's a TA here. What fruits and vegetables tag TA? And I can tell you somehow quickly that it's tagged by uh, broccoli, watermelon, and banana. So that's that's TAs. This TA is tagged by broccoli. These TAs are tagged by watermelon. And these TAs are tagged by banana. And somehow I can do that quickly without looking at all the occurrences of TA. Okay. So, and I don't care what the tags are. I just need the, the fact that they're run length compressible. If they're not run length compressible, I'll use more space, but it will still all work. So this is where we get the theorem 
Uh, so we store a text T of length N in O of, so R is the number of runs in the VWT. So we need that for money. T is the number of runs in the tag array. So this, in this case, this tag array consists of fruits and vegetables. And LCE is the space for the LCE data structure, um, which is small, very small in practice. And so when you give me a pattern of length M, I can find the MEMS of P with respect to T in M log N time. And for each MEM, I can list all the distinct tags associated with that MEM in constant time per tag listed. So for example, if TA is a MEM, I can list uh, broccoli, watermelon, banana in time proportional to three. Okay. How does this work? Well, we're going to use uh, these, these suffix ray samples. So now we're going to store these pointers, but notice this is now not at the run boundaries in the BWT. This is at the run boundaries in the tag array. So this, this run of grapes ends here. So I have, I have this position, this goes here. This is a run, so this goes here. Now this, these bananas, okay, this is a run of cherries. So this goes, I think there, it's hard to tell. This one goes, uh, okay. So now if you give me this TA and you say, what tags, what fruits and vegetables tag TA? I can say, well, I can, this is a TA, so it's banana for one. But then I can say, what about this run down here? Well, I can do an LCE query. I know where this is, because you tell me this. Money tells me this position in, in the, the, the data set. So I can do an LCE query between here and the start of this run, and it's going to tell me mm, the LCE is only one, right? TA and TT match on only the first character. So these watermelons don't tag TAs. But now I go and say, okay, well, the preceding run, this watermelon, oh, this LC, this is, this is two. So this does tag a TA. So TA is tagged by a watermelon. And then you jump up and you say, well, what about this run? Oh, well, this, this LCE, I have this position because it's the beginning of a run boundary. Uh, sorry, it's out of run boundary. So this is also two. So TA is also tagged by broccoli. And then you jump up and you say, what about apples? No, this LCA is LCE is zero. So it's not tagged by apples. And because these are lexicographically sorted, if there were any TAs, they'd have to be here. So I don't find the interval of TAs. I don't find the lexicographic interval of TAs, but I can do this now. It looks like I was linearly checking each run and that would, that would be slow. You could do this by doubling search or actually you can add some more data structures, magic, um, document listing and wavelet trees on the LCPs and stuff like that. And you can make this fast. So it's just going to take logarithmic time for the whole stuff. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with what we're trying to do? Well, I don't actually want to tag things. I don't want to tag the characters with fruits and vegetables. I want to tag them with the position, with the, the IDs of the vertices where these cyclic shifts start getting processed. For example, six is where CAT starts being, is, is processed. So this three is where, so TACAT, T-A-C-A-T, that's where this is processed. So I store the vertex IDs. So what does this mean? It means if you give me GATA, the first mem of GATA GAT, then I can say, okay, I'm going to check and I check the next. Well, GATA, an occurrence of GATA, start is, we start processing it at vertex one. Okay, what about the next run? Oh, no. LCE query between this and this, it comes back as zero. Zero is less than four. So this eight is not interesting. What about this six? LCE query between, we know where this is, we know where this is, we have this stored, so we can do an LCE query. This comes back and says four, four is equal to four, so yes. There's also GATA starts being processed at six. 
G-A-T-A. Hmm, great. Okay, what about the pre preceding run? Nope, LCE is zero, so two is not interesting. So we report one and six, which are G-A-T-A, -A. yep, G-A-T-A, -A. yes. And these are the non-chimeric matches. They're the only matches in this particular graph, but in general, they're all the non-chimeric matches and only the non-chimeric matches. What about Tagat, the other mem? Okay, well, we check this. We go and say, okay, well, what's the LCE? We can do this because we, have, we know this and we, money gives us this position here. And we have this position stored. And so we say, okay, between here and here, it's one, one is less than five. Between here and here, it's two, two is less than five. So we to get the only place where we start processing to get in the graph is at four, like this. Bit more interesting, what about TA? Well, we've sort of already done that with the fruits and vegetables, but um, let's go down. This says LCE is one, so we ignore this three. We go up, LCE is two, so we say, okay, first it's four, it's also three. We go up to eight. Oh, it's two. LCE is two. It's also eight. Go up uh, one. No, LCE is zero, less than two. So we report three, four, and eight. So it's TA, TA, and TA. So the corollary of our tagging theorem is we can store a text we choose the tags to be the vertex, the, the vertex IDs where the, where the cyclic shifts start being processed in, in the, the graph, which we can think of as a DFA, if we love atomic theory. We can store a text T of length N in R plus T plus LCE space, where R and T are the numbers of runs in the BWT and tag arrays. Um, these are small. In practice, we have some experimental numbers. Um, so with the tag storing vertex IDs, and LC is a space for an LCE data structure, which is small in practice, such that when given a pattern P of length M, we can find the MEMS in M log N time. And for each MEM, we can list all the distinct vertices where we start processing occurrences of T of that MEM in constant time per vertex listing. So this is what we wanted way back at the beginning. So conclusion. So we have money, we have Maria. In retrospect, they're really simple. Why did it take us so long to figure this stuff out? Because it wasn't retrospect back then. So we have a pipeline for a goal. We can index the data set as a set of strings losslessly. That means we don't add any chimeric variations and we don't exclude anybody. We don't leave anybody out of our graph or out of our data set. So our index is going to contain all of the variations that people give us. We find good seeds in the reads exactly matching substrings in the, of the data set. So again, nothing chimeric, nothing, nothing new. We index the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. We map those seeds directly onto walks in the graph. In time independent of the number of matches in the data set, we don't even compute the number of matches in the data set because we don't know how to do that. That would be finding lexicographic interval for MEMS, and we don't know how to do that without using those sublinear data structures, which are too big. So when Maria is finished, somebody, but somebody else, because I'm the indexing guy, so I'm done. So somebody else should still extend the MEMS to approximate matches for the reads, build a consensus sequence, et cetera, et cetera. But the indexing part, I hope, is finished. Not really. I mean, I still have a few ideas. Um, there are always tricks up my sleeve, but not these sleeves, actually. But OK. The other thing I want to note is that you don't have to have the graph actually being a DFA. You don't have to have all of the genomes being walks in the graph. The graph, we don't really care what it is, as long as the tag array is run length compressible. So you can simplify the graph. It's now no longer your data structure. Your graph is just your coordinate system. It's your map. You just use it to summarize and aggregate the, report, the results you report when you give it to the next stage in the pipeline. So we don't weaken the index. You can simplify your graph without changing what your results will be, what the results you get will be from the index. So um, 
Okay. Uh, oh, yay, 45 minutes. Okay, so many thanks to lots of people I've worked with, including the people who took me out for kebabs, who, who sort of got all this stuff finished off. And also to people who pay me, Dal, who pays me monthly, and some funding agencies who pay me um, not quite monthly, but, but still thank you to them. Um, um, so yes, these are people without whom this would not have, actually there are a lot of other people without whom this would not have happened, but um, um, are there just 40, 45 minutes basically. So 15 minutes, I can't believe there are gonna be 15 minutes of questions, but um, okay, questions? Just to the ending one. So maybe first let other people ask questions. Because I've already heard the it's such a very small thing that I don't know. Okay. Oh, so I, I've broken it since last week. Okay. You're the host, yes, of course. Uh, I am thinking to read, but uh, the solving the MAM maths on pandemic problem. The original solution is the GCSA from Dionysia and the machine. Is it true? Uh, GCSA, so the, yes, the thing is, so the RLCSA, and then they did the graph. The thing is, so lots of people have been trying to index the graphs. Yeah. There are two reasons why we don't want to do that. One is it's hard. There are, I mean, we can index, now we can do things like we, at DCC in a month, um, Nicola Cotomacho is gonna present a result about, we can find MEMS on Wheeler graphs. But there are lower bounds saying, generally pattern matching on graphs is hard. General graphs, it's nasty. Notice that in this talk, I was not assuming any properties of the graph. I mean, I was assuming it was run length compressible, but that just means that if two characters, two base pairs have this have very long common context, so they're beside each other in the BWT, then they're probably going to be processed at the same vertex of the pan genome graph. That's a completely reasonable assumption, I think. And if you break it, I mean, if you give me some weird pan genome graph where stuff that's similar is processed in different places and stuff that's not similar is processed in the same place, this data structure will still work. It will just be big. So the first thing is we don't have any constraints on the kind of graph um, and indexing the graph is hard. The second thing is it goes back to that that idea that if you pack in very too many variations, the graph becomes fuzzy, right? Then, then if you, because if you have thousands and tens of thousands of people, millions of people maybe, in, and you try to represent them all with a variation graph and you put in all the variations because we don't want to exclude anybody's variations because that's bad, it's not nice then the problem is most, a lot of places in the genome will be variation sites for somebody. So the standard technique now is to exclude variations that are less than 1%. But that is exclusionary. It is not equity, diversity, and inclusion. So if you include all of those, then you're going to have, you're going to have double loops at a lot of sites in your pangenome graph and you're going to get a lot of chimeric matches. So these are, the, these are the two things. Even if we could figure out the technical problems with indexing the graph, there's still this fundamental problem. So actually, also I should, uh, Ben told me to mention the phrase, our representation, so indexing the data set respects linkage disequilibrium. So this means that you respect the, the sort of the co-occurrences of variations because that ATAG, we had people who had one T in our little five person pan genome. And we had people who had GAT instead of CAT, but we didn't have anybody who had both of those because 
the distribution of variations is not independent. So variations, this is actually how imputation works. Variations, so they, the co occur it, it, knowing about one tells you about the other. So the, the pangenome graph, if you index the graph, unless you make it really, really complicated, you don't know that you can't, you can't have a single T and then an a, 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 the ATAG because it just considers all of the paths sort of equally valid. You could weight it, but that would be complicated, it'd be hard. So, I mean, um, the indexing the graph results are of course cool and hi, Veli and Yoni, if you ever watch this, um, yeah, but, um, but I think this is, this has advantages. The key advantages are there. One, you can actually do it. And two, it, it doesn't require you to exclude anybody's variations. Because with the punch genome graphs, if you included everything, it would be just a big fuzzy, fuzzy ball of mess. Okay. Anybody in, in Zoom? Any objections? Do people love pangenographs? Anybody love Kamers? Doesn't don't like MEMS as seeds? <laughs> we can discuss this afterwards, okay? Take it <laughs> offline. <laughs> So maybe I can ask one question about um, you said in, in the time bounds uh, in your final data structure that um, for the occurrences you get each occurrence in constant time. So I wonder if you have uh, you, you build it. I think uh, a LTP, a sparse LTP array on the tag boundary such that yeah. you don't actually issue an LTP query for each. No. Oh, but okay. you just put uh, uh, the, the two in the near, if it's yeah, easy, and then you, you do a wavelet report. Yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be it'll be log. It'll be logarithmic, but that's yeah. okay because the LCE is logarithmic anyway. Yeah. And then, so then you get sort of the inter. You get the so now you sort of rank reduce it down to an array that's just the the run heads. Yeah. And then you use Mutu Krishnan's document listing on that. So this is how you get okay. um, logarithmic. So, oh yeah, I cheated. Um, <laughs> so the thing is I hid the logarithmic time for the two LCE queries. Yeah. And for the, the query on the wavelet tree, yeah. I hide that in here. Okay. And, and then I can do the constant time for vertex listing. Okay. So if, if you don't have that, then yeah, I would be, logarithmic overhead per mem right. plus constant time but that's just like ugly to write so yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Well, kind of interesting yeah this is the, yeah this is the data structure of magic like the next time i present this it will be to biologists and they are probably not going to want to know that i'm just going to say it's magic and they will with luck they will believe me so i have to prepare for biology questions which well, the Moni does not support LD queries, but it does Moni does. So Moni, you just do one. <laughs> this is the, the, it's the concept, so. I, okay. Funny was <laughs> funny. We are rolling funny into money. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, money uses LC queries. It's one pass now. Okay, yeah. Money takes in all of the money variants. Okay. okay. I got this one. Yeah, yes, it's, it's multi. <laughs> it's very multi. Okay. Um, so, yay, I'm done. I'm done. The end is, no, I'm not done. I mean, sorry? Okay, so really, nobody on Zoom wants to ask anything? I don't know how to turn on the Zoom thing. Uh, so, Hiro, everything was completely clear. <laughs> or yeah, was it just more or less? <laughs> more, oh, more okay. less. Okay. Yeah, it's, this is you really. That's they took me out for kebabs, and I was like, I explained to them, it's like, oh, this is such a hard problem. It's hard because of. Oh wait, no, it's not. 
so I, I felt a bit silly afterwards, but um, but yeah, better late than never. Um, so yeah, it's just really the toehold lemma. It's just a, a slightly souped up versions of the toehold lemma. Um, so the yeah, so. Uh, So, but can can the can the mic actually hear <laughs> other people asking questions? I mean, it looks like a very cool mic. The graph? How come the graph? Dag. It, it's not a dag. It's not dag. Sorry, sorry. Yes, actually. Um, at, at the winter workshop, at the Vangaya Alpaca winter workshop, somebody asked, does it have to be a DAG? No, it doesn't. But generally, the this is, so I said it's a DFA, which doesn't have to be a cyclic. So yeah, sorry, deterministic finite automaton. But those are generally cyclic. Um, and so yeah, as Simon Kumas asked, does this have to, no, it doesn't have to be. And generally, actually, this is not what they look like. Generally, they're, so you, you a pan genome graph you can do either a de Bruyne graph which is easy like easier or you can do this thing these cool things that that Yoni and 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 well Benedict Patton and Eric Garrison are doing um called variation graphs uh, um which um but it's easier to draw and explain like this it's it's, it's so yeah I should have added a cycle but I was kind of too lazy to to actually go back and because I to, to add a cycle to the graph, I would have to redo the, all the slides. Um, maybe someday I will do that. Uh, possibly I will try to get somebody else to do that for me. For you, it is. So the thing, this, the, the key thing, so at the, at the Shonan, Nicola Pratza was saying, oh, you're using combinatorial properties. And I said, this is why I put this fruit and vegetables thing in here. I was like, <laughs> I don't care what the tags are. You can, you can just tag each character, each base pair with which chromosome it's in. Fine, then I can report the chromosomes. You can tag it with the base pair's favorite color. I report the as long as this is run length compressed. So basically, as long as base pairs which have similar quantum contexts, which are basically going to be um, corresponding characters in the in the uh, in the in the various genomes, or they might be characters in long repetitions. Yep. Um, as long as they get sort of the same, generally they usually get the same tag. This will be small. So so far we only Simon Humas at the at the Winter Wet Lab actually got us a few numbers. I'm going to try to get more numbers from Yoni when I'm in California. Um, it looks like these things, the number of runs in the tag array, if you tag it with the with the vertices of the variation graph. There are about twice as many runs in the tag array as in the BWT. But this is actually not bad because for money, for the toehold lemma, and for, well, for money, you need suffix array samples at the top and bottom. But for Maria, you only need Maria, actually. You only need, sorry, it's it's named, it's named after somebody. So actually, okay. So yeah, to be honest, so is money. Um, you only need a suffix array entry at the top. You don't need two suffix array entries per run. So it's actually probably going to be work out to be about as big or possibly even smaller than money when we actually get it all fine tuned. Um, but yeah, no, it, it doesn't, we really don't care what the graph, like I said, you can simplify the graph. You don't have to put all the variations into the graph because we take care of that for you in the index, we have all the variations in the index. So we're not gonna lose anybody. We're not excluding anything. The, the graph is just, can be a very coarse resolution map. And we're just sort of, we're telling you where these matches are. So it's 
See, this is separated the problem from the graph. So, so this, yeah, because Eric Garrison is actually, he's the one who said, he considers the, the real purpose of the graph. So he's got the graph index, but he said, no, you can also, he wants the graph as a coordinate system. Right, because you you use this to as as a, for reporting, but not necessarily for indexing. He doesn't he doesn't insist on how the data structures work. So maybe I can convince people to use this. Maybe I will see. I will maybe know in a few weeks. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is this is this is actually the. Recon web page and it's like okay, new to by analysis of multiple ancestry groups. So I was, I was reading this and it's like okay, well there've been some recent advantages in the treatment of these men and okay, um, but but so far the largest of these groups are women that have focused mainly on people of European or East Asian ancestral background. <clears throat> now Okada and his colleagues, uh, two hundred sixty-five percent of whom had non-European ancestry with participating in European ancestry. Okay, so and then you scroll down to the end. This stu the study highlights the importance of further efforts to diversify studies and increase sample sizes from underrepresented ancestries to improve the power of these analyses and the accuracy of polygenic risk scores, especially in non-European ancestral groups. So look, oh, this is cool, so cool. I mean, I read the news and I find BBC stories. Um, I find Guardian stories about this stuff. And now I show up to Recon and just when you log into the Wi-Fi, it pops this up and it's like, oh, cool. So this, I just wanted to, to say, ah, oh, see this, I could have, I, I can quote this too. Um, okay, so that was just because it's a cool coincidence. It's not a coincidence. I mean, the Guardian. So it's it, you, it was Stat News. Oh, I'm over time. It was Stat News, which is sort of like not main, a bit mainstream. Then the Guardian, which is mean, really mainstream, and then the BBC, which is about as mainstream as you can get. So this is actually a, a current hot topic. And woo, the, we think we have solved the problem. Maybe, I hope.